Hi guys, Dane here, and today we're going to be taking a look at The Long Utopia by Terry Pratchett and Stephen Baxter. So this is book number four in his Long Earth series, and this one I'm doing a little bit different because basically <laughs> these reviews become super long because there's always so much I want to say about these books. So in this one, I've only actually just started reading it, and I'm going to kind of film it as I go along. And we're going to get my impressions in real time, I suppose. So I'm going to read the blurb. It is the middle of the 21st century. The cataclysms of Step Day and the Yellowstone eruption have sent humanity out into the long earth. Society, on a battered datum earth and beyond, continues to evolve, and new challenges emerge. In a far distant world, a cantankerous and elderly lobsang lives with Agnes in the community of New Springfield and endeavours to lead a normal life. They even adopt a child. But there are rumours of hauntings, strange sightings in the sky. On this world, something isn't right. Millions of steps away, Joshua receives an urgent summons from New Springfield. Lobsang believes that what is blighting his earth now threatens all the worlds of the long earth. To counter this will require the combined efforts of humankind, machine, and the superintelligent next. And some must make the ultimate sacrifice. So the first thing that I tabbed is the very first sentence, because this helps to give you a sense of where we are in time. In February 2052, in the remote Long Earth. So I think, you know, that's what, 40 years after Step Day? Something like that? Did it just say in that thing that I've re re read? <laughs> I can't remember what I just read. This is quite cool, though, this little paragraph then. On another world, under a different sky, in another universe, whose distance from the datum, the Earth of mankind, was nevertheless counted in the mundanity of human steps, Joshua Valiente lay beside his own fire. Hunting creatures grunted and snuffled down in the valley bottom. The night was purple velvet, alive with insects and spiky with invisible jiggers and no seams that made kamikaze dives on every exposed inch of Joshua's flesh. So we get a throwback here as well. This story's actually been told in a previous book, but um, I'm guessing it's going to become more important in this book, you know? In fact, prediction time, maybe that's where the next went. Uh, so the next are like this super intelligent race of human beings. So maybe they've learned a way to do this. But anyway, Bill said now, I know a fellow who knew a fellow. Oh, yes. Who camped out on the cue ball for a bet just for a night all alone, as you would in the nip too. That was part of the bet. So it means he was drunk. Sure. In the morning, he woke up with a hangover from hell. Drinking alone, never wise. Now, this fellow was a natural stepper. So he got his stuff together in a blind daze and stepped, but he says he sort of stumbled as he stepped. Stumbled? He didn't feel as if he'd stepped the right way. What? How's that possible? What do you mean? Well, we step east or we step west, don't we? You have the soft places, the shortcuts, if you can find them, but that's pretty much it. Anyhow, this fella felt like he'd stepped a different way, perpendicular, like he'd stepped north. And? And he emerged onto some kind of other world. It was night, not day. No stars in a clear sky. No stars, sort of. Instead, your storytelling style really great sometimes, Bill. But I got you hooked, haven't I? Get on with it. What did he see? He saw all the stars. All of them. He saw the whole feckin' galaxy, man. The Milky Way. From outside. Uh, and then we have uh, Lobsang who's still going. So Lobsang started out as a vending machine with the reincarnated spirit of a, Buddh a Tibetan uh, Buddhist motorcycle repairman. Uh, and he's, but he's starting to have doubts about himself. So he says, Since then I've had doubts. I told you of this, Joshua. I've had the odd sensation that I remembered my previous incarnations. But that is not the accepted norm under the Tibetan tradition. If my reincarnation has been fully successful, I should shed all memory of my previous lives. Perhaps this reincarnation is imperfect then. Or, he glanced at Agnes, perhaps there is some more mundane explanation. I am, after all, nothing but a creature of electrical sparks in distributed stores of black corporation gel. Perhaps I've been hacked. Perhaps he has. So I like here we have basically these people called comas have sprung up who just kind of go travel from world to world, you know, and live on what they find. It says here, the lifestyle they call coma is just too tempting, especially after an accident or some such. You get swathes of workers just downing tools and walking away to go pick fruit. People don't have to work like this, and increasingly, they just won't. Which, of course, is also leading to labour shortages and problems like that. We have a little moment where they visit uh, Salisbury Cathedral. So it says, there was an immediate hush, a sense of even deeper age. Rocky had never been in such a building before in his life. They walked down the cross-shaped building's long axis. 
Pillars of stone stood in tall rows, supporting arches which in turn held up a fantastically ornate roof. Rocky saw that the building itself was intact, more or less. Even the great stained glass windows were still complete. But the contents had been more or less stripped, leaving the long stone floor bare. Maybe the benches for the congregations that must once have gathered here had been taken for firewood. The whole thing must be built of nothing but stone and wood, Rocky thought, but it looked light as air. I've been to Salisbury Cathedral, so that was quite cool. Uh, then we have a reference to Widdershins as a direction, which is like a tie-in with Terry Pratchett's Discworld. And also we, we basically get these bits, which I didn't like so much, where we keep jumping back in time to learn about Joshua's ancestors, the Valientes. One of the things I liked as well, there was a reference to Robin Hood and his men. They had the ability to step, which is why the Sheriff of Nottingham could never find them. There's also a great little joke here. It says, uh, where they're trying to explain it. And they say, perhaps we should send a naturalist to explore. Call for Mr. Darwin. Because obviously Charles Darwin would have been alive at this point because we're back in sort of the Victorian time. It is interesting, but it's kind of, again, I, I don't tend to like books that jump backwards and forwards through time so much. Although we do get references here. In fact, I'll read this, read, read this uh, paragraph out. But Hackett didn't go so far back this time. Instead, he spoke of the Armada. Of course, the court of Queen Elizabeth was replete with spies and agents, but my own distant ancestor did more than most to penetrate Philip's admiralty and return with plans of the invasion fleet. Elizabeth never knew it, it said, but he got his hand shaken by Sir Francis Drake. A few tens of years later, another ancestor helped destabilise Cromwell and his roundheads, for their godlessness made them prone to superstition, and they were bedazzled by a bit of fake haunting. Dash on another hundred years, and a distant uncle was popping in and out of the camp of the Jacobite pretender, as he marched into England during the revolt of 45, getting up to all sorts of mischief. And I'll admit to a bit of work on the other side, when one of my great-great-aunts of a colonial family spied on Lord Cornwallis during the American War. So this is just like what some of these historical people had been doing with the ability to step between worlds. We go back now to Lobsang and his child and his child's having a tantrum and he looks at Agnes and says, You could have helped. And she says, I'm helping by not helping. You're the one with experience of these creatures. Children, Lobsang. They're called children. Now I, could, I see why you'd call them creatures. And then we have a little bit about what some of the books that Lobsang's been reading in his retirement. Of course, it wasn't all newly invented. Lobsang was very impressed when Oliver Irwin showed George a complete set of the whole Earth catalogue downloaded onto a wind-up e-reader. Lobsang had copied it into his own library, which was a row of mostly physical books kept in the gondola, including Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, Verne's Mysterious Island, Twain's A Connecticut Yankee at the Court of King Arthur, Stuart's When Earth Abides, Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz, Dartnell's The Knowledge, and miniaturised bound sets including early volumes of Scientific American, a pre-electronic Encyclopedia Britannica, even a facsimile of the first encyclopedia ever published by Diderot in the 17th century. Encyclopedias are hedges against the fall of civilization, Lobsang had said to Agnes, only slightly pompously. He seemed to have a long-term dream of building a civilization from scratch right here in the wilderness, like Verne's stranded travellers in Mysterious Island, all the way up to electricity generators and copper phone wires, and maybe going further, coming up with a kind of portable civilization kit to give to the comas and their kind, to ensure the lessons painfully learned over 10,000 years of human progress weren't lost as humanity scattered across the long earth. Lobsan couldn't help but think big. So we're coming back now to this idea of uh, time slowing down on this particular version of the Long Earth. Um, so Shimi, the cat, says, No, please, Agnes. She opened her green eyes wide. Now, according to your clocks, the day is shorter. 23 hours only, plus a few minutes. You were right. You were right. So the world is spinning faster on its axis, and we start to investigate why. We learn as well in Joshua's family past about the Knights of Discorporia, which are basically like a group of people who could step, who came together for the benefit of the country during the Victorian period. But again, this is all this, you know, flashback stuff, which I'm not particularly a fan of. What is interesting, though, is that um, a character there talks about the tactics that they used to take the steppers down and uh, this is the same tactic that was used in 2040 or whatever in one of the previous books this is the way we've learned to tackle you waltzers hit you with overwhelming force before you've got time to think about it before you've time to slip away to whichever corner of hell you godless creatures visit when you're not here and then unconscious bundle you up in a hole in the ground like this where you can't even waltz out uh, one of the characters who is one of the next uh, which is like the next evolution of Homo sapiens, I guess. So they're super intelligent. And they use something called quick talk. And they say, oh, if only you could quick talk. 
English is utterly inadequate and slow, like shouting poetry down a drain pipe. Of course, the irony there being that she called it utterly inadequate instead of just inadequate, so she added three extra syllables. So actually, instead of using quick talk, she spoke in regular speech and then elongated it unnecessarily, but... <laughs> Then Joshua and Lobsang hang out again and uh, they're talking about watching some movies and the movies they suggest are Blues Brothers, Contact and Galaxy Quest. And then Joshua says, nothing with Julie Andrews. Okay, and now I need to read this scene because it's so sad. So this is like the robot cat is starting to die, basically. And, Ag and uh, Agnes is, is with the cat, Shimi. I'm here, sweetheart. The cat shuddered and yowled and Agnes stroked her until she was still. We still have choices, Shimi. You know that. We can take you to the gondola, the workshop. No, this is my place. I have lived here these last years as a true cat. People accept me. The mice fear me. I disdain the dogs. It is right that I... I... The sudden judder in her voice was mechanical, profoundly disturbing, an intrusion of artificiality, or in fact of reality, Agnes supposed. But she stroked Shimi's side until she was calm again. Shimi said now, Agnes, say goodbye to Joshua for me and Lobsang, and make sure you tell Maggie Kaufman what became of me. Tell her I expect Mac to crack a bottle of single malt, old Lang Syne, not the cheap stuff, in memory of a flea bucket. I will. You've always been a good friend, Shimi. I am Ben's cat now. That's all I've ever wanted to be, I've discovered. And I, I... Her voice tailed off into a soft, quite convincing purr. Then, as Agnes stroked her, she shuddered once, and her eyes opened wide, and their soft green LED light faded to dark. Oh god, it like traumatised me. Cat deaths are always sad in books, but it made me think of like the Mars rover and I think it was the last, one of the last, or the last message the Opportunity rover sent back to Earth was something like, my batteries are low and it's getting dark. And here we have how the next functions, and I really like the, or the sound of bits of their society. I mean, it's not the best society and there are various hints thrown that it's by no means perfect. It's by no means a utopia. But, um, some of their ideas are pretty sound. So, I know what you're thinking, Roberta said. How does the work get done? In a town full of geniuses, who decides who sweeps the street or empties the cesspit? No, Stan said. You just do it. No mystery. Rocky frowned. Well, it's a mystery to me. Roberta said, I think Stan understands this intuitively. We just get it done. When we see a problem, such as the allocation of basic work, we see further than you. We see all the way to a solution immediately. The work must be done. This ditch must be dug. Some are better equipped for such work. There can be no argument about that. And then that necessary solution mandates our necessary actions. The only discussion is the immediately practical. Is it to be my turn today or yours? Do you see? And there's this really interesting thing as well where they talk about the role of the teachers in next society. And uh, they're there to listen and to supervise, not to teach. And so we find we can learn from the play of even the youngest children who arrive in this world fresh, free of the limitations and misconceptions we inherited from humanity. We may garner from their play anything from a new design of spanner to a new intuitive approach to transfinite mathematics. Even the babies, even the toddlers, when they learn to speak, invent their own vocabulary, their own grammar, even their own mathematics. We don't teach the children so much as learn from them. And I think this is really interesting as well. Um, they bring in the trolls to help the children to sleep. And Rocky asks, why do they need help sleeping? Roberta glanced at him. They are extremely bright children, Rocky. At a very young age, they gain an awareness of the fragility of life, of their own vulnerability. Human children, I think, believe they are immortal, whereas our children... Ah, said Stan, no illusions. And they can't be distracted by accounts of heaven and the afterlife, or other fairy stories. Yeah, that's why I'm afraid of death. <laughs> I like this little bit of, uh, I suppose, exposition and world building here, really. Uh, a character called Nelson has gone off to find out the truth about Joshua Valiente's parents. And uh, he talks about um, some of the different stories about steppers. So he says, not all of them are conclusive. For instance, have you heard of the Angel of Mons? No. Should I? Maybe not. The Great War, 1914. British soldiers in the trenches spread stories of mysterious figures who would appear and vanish again, helping the wounded. Some said they were the ghosts of English archers from the Battle of Agincourt centuries earlier. Hmm. Whereas in fact they were my great-great-uncles. That's the idea. He opened a notebook and checked an entry. The official line is that it all came from a bit of fiction by a Welsh writer called Arthur Matchen, which was a very effective cover-up for the time. 
In the 1940s, during the next war, I believe there must have been steppers aiding elements of the Home Guard, the volunteer army who were preparing to resist a Nazi invasion of England. I saw a version of a memoir by Tom Whittringham from which some pages had been excised. Whittringham's set of guerrilla war training for selected Home Guard units. There could easily have been useful refuges in the stepwise worlds, resistance hideouts, caches of food, explosives, you name it. Everything but guns and ammo because of the steel because you can't take iron between worlds. And then Joshua meets his father, and then someone says to him, you atoned with your father, Joshua. Important step on your spiritual journey as a mythic hero. Which is true, it's like, you know, one of those old, you read it in writing advice books and stuff. So the people in this world where time is running faster, they're not too happy about the government coming to help. And there's a reason that they're so crabby, which is that they're not getting enough sleep because the hours are changing, which I thought was very simple, but interesting. And then we have this character called Margarita Jar. Uh, she's the chief science officer on the Cowley. And she says, my own speciality is biology. That's where I started. And as a biologist, I have to tell you that unfortunately for you and your kids, your animals, your crops, indeed for all the living things native to this particular stepwise earth, now that the spin-up has reached a period of 20 hours or so, we've passed a fundamental limit. You can't adapt to a day of that length or shorter and nor can other living things. Experiments connected to the space program have shown this. 20 or 21 hours is the minimum length of day we can withstand. And I wondered if that's true, but I also thought, well, surely when you're on the space, when you're on, when you're on the space station, you're not living 24 hour days because you're orbiting the Earth. So I got so confused by that. I was like, how can they have proved that it's impossible when their very survival there proves that it's possible? deep and then we work we learn basically why it's speeding up there are these silver beetle things and they're building this like band around the planet and this band is basically the reason why thing it's starting to speed up and they realize the reason why they're doing it they're trying to speed the planet up to the point at which it will explode so that they can then harvest the raw materials of the earth to basically like clone themselves and go out into all the other long earths into all the galaxies and just colonize everything you know and the joke is made, it's, it's not that different to humans and the way that we keep on having kids and keep self-replicating. So they go back and they find like the old unit of Lobsang that was in the first book and like missing, presumed dead effectively because they need an, like an older version of his software. And they find him and he says, something has happened. Joshua said gently, you could say that. Are the odds against us? Is the situation grim? You can put it like that, Sally said. Although that sounds like a line from a movie. I like this little joke here as well. Uh, I imagine Vulcans, Joshua admitted to Sally. She rolled her eyes. Look at us, what a crew. Three androids, the egghead science types, two blank-eyed brainiacs, two bewildered mom-and-pop homesteaders, and two lifelong misfits in me and thee, Joshua. Agnes said dryly. It's like a travelling Wilburys reunion tour. Okay, then they realise what they're going to have to do to sort of save the long earth so he says uh the threat of their spreading is great we think we have a way we must seal off this world make it impossible to step into or out of we've been studying we have been studying the phenomenon of the long earth stepping itself we believe it may be possible to do this there will be costs and there are costs indeed one of those costs has to be paid by a character called Stan who's kind of featured throughout it and towards the end he's kind of drawing parallels with Jesus Christ in the way that he's talking to people. We also have just a throwaway reference to the Oasis album Be Here Now. And then Lob Sang, Sally and Stan all go to this world as it's spinning faster and faster and I'm just going to read this out. She grabbed her companion's hands firmly. The three of them stood close together, holding hands in a ring, face to face on this desolate hill, resisting the gusty wind. They had to shout to make themselves heard. Lobsang said, When shall we three meet again? Sally grinned. In thunder, lightning, or in rain. When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. Stan blinked a squall of rain out of his eyes. Don't look at me like that. We had good schools in Miami West 4. It wasn't all stork jack engineering. So I think that was cool. A little reference to uh, Macbeth there. And here's how they kind of describe what this operation they're effectively trying to do on the long, the long Earth. So he says uh, they want to like visualize it as a necklace of worlds, not the threads of one pearl is cut out of the chain, the pearl that's tangled up with the planetarian necklace. 
detach this world from the Long Earth necklace completely. Uh, which I have thoughts on, which I'm going to go on in a second, but I only have two more tabs. And then when they're, when they're successful at this, they say, like, if the Nex can take apart and reconstruct the Long Earth itself, what will they do with such powers? And the response is, that's no longer our concern. And so exp and it says here, what they do is, the, the silver beetles who are destroying the Earth, they want to capture the dispersed mass and turn it into copies of themselves, probably, Lobsang said. The numbers are staggering. If they turn this whole world into a horde of beetles, each of which weighs as much as an adult human, say, then there could be as many as 10 billion trillion of them, scattering in all directions, far more beetles than there are stars in the galaxy. And each one in principle capable of landing on a virgin world and replicating away until it's achieved the same damn thing again. So this is why they don't want them to expand into the Long Earth stepwise. But the thing is, is we established in the Long Mars that the Long Earth and the Long Mars run in like different kinds of synchronization basically so theoretically they could just go from that version of earth to that version of mars and then step through mars and then come back out again so i'm not too sure how that's going to work that also probably made absolutely no sense unless you've read this book but uh, anyway yeah rating time i gave this a 3.5 out of 5 i feel like the series itself is starting to become like self-limiting because basically the authors have written all this science into it and in the beginning that helped to steer the story and provide a backbone but now we're at the point at which they can only really write the story in the directions in which the science leads them if that makes sense but um i mean it is still really enjoyable and i'm looking forward to reading the final book in the series so yeah so there we have it that's what i thought of the long utopia by terry pratchett and stephen baxter as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you enjoyed this video hit subscribe for more and i'll see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye-bye.